All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 11, Section 2, The Missouri Crisis. So we got a rather brief section here. Uh, this section only talks about the Missouri Crisis, but it is very, very, very important to US history. The crisis over Missouri is the issue which starts the Civil War, right? So what goes on here in Missouri in 1820 is when this is going on. This is the fundamental issue at really the heart of the Civil War. And you see it happening uh, really 40 years before the actual Civil War begins. And so the crisis over Missouri begins with Missouri statehood. So the idea was that Missouri was ready to become a state that was dictated by a certain population. Right, recall the Northwest Ordinance said that when a territory reaches, reaches a certain population, then it becomes a state, right? And of course, the benefits that states have is they send two senators to the House or to the Senate, right, to Congress. They send members of the House and they get electoral votes in the presidency, right? So there's there's a big benefit to becoming a state rather than simply just a mere territory of the United States. You get a lot more political power, especially on the federal level, not to mention a, a, a number of other things. So when Missouri, which is right here, actually, you guys, right here, this is Missouri. So when that territory had enough people to become a state, it essentially applied for statehood. Now about Missouri at the time was that when people settled it, they also brought the, their slaves with them. That at the time of 1820, when Missouri was ready for statehood, there was maybe you know 10,000 slaves or so that lived in that particular area. And because of the three-fifths compromise, what that meant was that those 10,000 slaves essentially translated to 6,000 additional, uh, we might call that additional uh, uh, representation. All right, remember or recall that three-fifths compromise states that three-fifths of the slave population, I think my math is correct here, three-fifths of the slave population gets to be counted on the total population in order to determine things like Vote. So, for example, in the House of Representatives, each state gets as many votes as their population has for the Electoral College for voting for a president, which, of course, has an effect on selecting the Supreme Court, uh, among other things. Uh, the slave population gets to count as those things. And so the big debate or the big question about Missouri was, was Missouri going to be a free state or was it going to be a slave state? And it's this argument right here. Right, it's the question about slave states and free states in Western lands that is at the fundamental root of it. As you might imagine, all of the Northern states that you see in blue here on this map wanted Missouri to be a free state, right? So maybe let's go ahead and underline it with blue, right? So all the free states want Missouri to be a free state. And all of the slave states obviously want Missouri to be a slave state because what that means, amongst other things, not just for slavery itself, but what it means is that when it comes to the Senate, who's going to have two more senators? Is it going to be the slave states or is it going to be the free states? In the House, who's going to have more votes? Is it going to be northern states or is it going to be southern states? Who's going to have more votes to cast in the Electoral College, which of course have an impact on the Supreme Court? So a lot of this... Um, a lot of the debate about the free states and the slave states is not necessarily about slavery per se. In fact, most politicians in 1820 are less concerned about slavery per se, but it's more about political power, right? Because when it comes to voting on issues in Congress and the president and everything else, um, you know, free states have their positions and slave states essentially have their position. And so one of the efforts to try and settle this uh, disagreement, right? And again, the disagreement is, should Missouri be a slave state or should Missouri be a free state? 
was the Talmadge Amendment. And this was proposed as a compromise, which stated essentially that Missouri would start off as a slave state, but gradually, oops, gradually become free. And of course, the big problem for the free position is, well, what do you do about those slaves that are already there? Right? What do you do about the 10,000 slaves that are already in Missouri? Well, the Talmadge Amendment, who was proposed, I believe, by James Talmadge, who was a northerner, said, look, we'll, we'll start off where slavery is legal, but we'll gradually move to a free state. That's, in fact, what most northern states did after the American Revolution. That proposal by Talmadge was outright rejected, right? So we're going to draw a big cross over this. It was rejected. And instead, uh, proponents or advocates claim that not only did uh, you know political matter uh, political power matter but in fact slavery itself was a positive good right so this term positive good is the way that specifically supporters of slavery uh, stated oops stated the benefits of slavery for really for both free and slave you know the positive good argument was really um you know it was a really sort of warped uh, logic in the way that it argued that slavery was a good thing so for example one of the things that proponents or supporters of slavery stated in defense of slavery was the fact that because slavery existed, because of the Atlantic slave trade, because slaves were bought from Africa to the United States, they were therefore exposed to Christianity, saving their souls, right, their eternal souls, uh, and therefore slavery was ultimately a good thing. Uh, these arguments about uh, a positive good were outright rejected by uh, Northerners, right, and fully supported by Southerners. What Missouri revealed was a sectional, not slit, but split, and that was because at the time, you essentially had two predominant political parties. Um, well, actually, I'm, I'm taking that back. You don't quite have two political parties, but you're, you're gearing up. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that back. Not quite yet. So this is right before 1820. This is Andrew Jackson hasn't quite gotten there yet. But what sectional split means is that instead of dividing along political party lines, you know, at this time, we'd still have you know, Republican and Federalists, although the Federalists had kind of floated by the wayside. Instead here, actually, this is a better um, and more relevant case. Politically, what's going on at this time, and this will be a good review of the early political history of the United States, is that first you had the first party system, right, which you had the uh, Federalists, let me go ahead and scroll down here, uh, Federalists and Democratic Republicans and then around and again you know this is from the early 1790s really up into the War of 1812 which was kind of when the Federalist Party fell apart uh, and then you have your second party system And that was roughly, we'll say 1824, because that was the election that Andrew Jackson won, but then lost. And this roughly goes to 1854. And this was Whigs and Democrats, right? Democrats were, of course, the pro-Andrew Jackson supporters. The Whigs were the anti-Jackson, but they came to find their own positions from 1824 to 1854. But you actually had a transition period right in here. And this is, in fact, when the Missouri crisis is taking place. And this was politically anyways, from 1812 to 1824, what we call the era of good feelings, right? It was when the Federalist Party had died out and everybody was a Democratic Republican. And so because there was only one political party and there was no fighting really taking place on a political uh, level, that's why we call this the era of good feelings, right? No political fighting. The reality is, though, it's not fighting politically, it's fighting sectionally. And this is revealed by the Missouri Compromise because the division was not political, instead it was, and maybe we'll get another color here to 
to point it out. It was north versus south because every single northern state, and if you were a congressman from a northern state, you supported the free state of Missouri. If you're from the south, you supported the slave state of Missouri. So this is where the divide is. And so it didn't look like, uh, you know, it, it was a pretty dire situation. Uh, both north and south were pretty much unwilling to compromise on this until you had the famed Missouri Compromise, which was to settle this issue once and for all. The Missouri Compromise stated two states would be created, right? Missouri would come into the Union, but it would come into the Union as a slave state. So in this case, the South won that argument over Missouri, right? This whole crisis, the South won that. However, to counterbalance the political power to balance out the Senate, to balance out the House, to balance out the electoral votes, the United States would create a new state in the form of Maine, and Maine would be a free state, right? And to make sure that this problem never, ever, ever happens again, because they knew that if, you know, if it was Missouri today, it'd be Kansas tomorrow and, you know, Nebraska the next day, uh, they drew a compromise line, and that's what's illustrated by this yellow mark here. And what the compromise line stated was everything that was south of this would be a slave state and everything that was north of this would be a free state and for you know for about 30 years this worked right that the missouri compromise for 30 years kept north and south at bay right you had the whole transpiring of the age of jackson and the resurgent whigs and all that other political history that took place but you know roughly around you know, the 1850s, uh, this issue, oops, 1840s and 1850s, this issue about free and slave states in the Western Territory is, is going to come up again.